All right, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. All right. Our Father in heaven, Abba Father, you are our teacher, you're our Lord. We thank you, Abba Father, that we can learn from you and that your scripture is sink deep into our hearts this morning, Abba Father. And that we'll live faithful lives for you this week, Abba Father, with the power of your Holy Spirit and waiting on your Son to return from heaven, Abba Father, that your kingdom be established. May it come soon in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So, last week we kind of started talking about a new topic because last week's reading from the prophets was the book of Obadiah. Okay? And remember, we got a treat. We got to hear a whole book of the Bible on Shabbat. Obadiah is the shortest book in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's only 21 verses. Right? And it is, it's a fantastic book. And it's got prophecies that apply for this day and age and for times to come. But the book of Obadiah is a prophecy against a people group called Edom. And if you just read Obadiah without any other biblical context, you go, man, why is God so mad at this people called Edom? Right? Who's also known as the people of Esau. And so what I was thinking about last week is that it would be good for us as a group to kind of go from Genesis to Revelation and to cover the topic that is the age-long struggle between Jacob and his descendants and Esau and his descendants. Okay? And last week, we began by covering even before Jacob and Esau were born, they were struggling. They were struggling together. Okay? If you missed last week, I would encourage you to uh, go catch up on the, uh, on the Bible study recording on YouTube. But we're going to move forward this morning. We talked about how there was a promise that was given to Rebekah even before her children, Jacob and Esau, were born. That they would struggle, they would continue to struggle together. But that eventually the older would serve the younger. Okay? And that's where we left off last week. So we want to talk about this so that we can have a, a whole picture from Genesis to Revelation, of this struggle between Jacob and Esau that never ends until there is a terminal point, and we'll find out when that is. Okay? But that this topic informs our understanding of Scriptures like Obadiah. Okay? And with this backdrop in mind, it's going to help us to have a better understanding of prophecies like Obadiah. Okay? So that's the point. But let's continue now. Move on past the womb and move on now to when the, the two children, Jacob and Esau, are grown men. You turn with me to Genesis chapter 27, verses starting in verse 30. And one thing I said last week, and I'll repeat it, just fair warning, is as we go through this study, we're going to read a lot of scriptures together because I want you to hear it, okay, and to kind of be with me on the same page. You'll turn with me to Genesis 27, verses 30 through 40. Now at this point, <clears throat> at this point, everybody remember what happened? If you're familiar with the life of Jacob and Esau, remember that one time? Remember that one time? <laughs> remember that one time? Esau came from the field. He was hunting, busy doing things. He was exhausted. And he saw Jacob there. He was cooking some stew, right? He says, oh, I'm exhausted. Ah, I'm so hungry. Give me some of that red stuff. Mm. <laughs> and Jacob said, I'll give it to you for your birthright, for the right of firstborn. 
Esau said, what does that matter to me? I'm going to die anyway. And so Esau sold his right as firstborn to Jacob for a bowl of soup. And the Torah comments on that and says, thus Esau despised his birthright. Esau got the nickname Edom from that incident because Edom in Hebrew means red. And when Esau said, give me some of that red stuff, he got the nickname from then on, Edom, red. Okay? But he gave away the rights of firstborn for that soup. And yet here he is in Genesis 27 expecting the blessing of the firstborn when the right of the firstborn is no longer his. He sold it. Right? So Genesis 27 in verse 30. At this point in the story, Jacob has just gone in to his father Isaac, dressed as Esau, to receive the blessing of firstborn. Because Isaac intended to give it to Esau. So Jacob went in and received it stealthily. And then he left, he left the room. Okay? Now, in 27 verse 30, Now it came about, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. Then he also made savory food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that you may bless me. Isaac, his father, said to him, Who are you? And he said, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently and said, Who, who was he? Then that hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate of all of it before you came and blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard these words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, my father. And he said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. Then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob, Yaakov? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, haven't you reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac replied to Esau, behold, I have made him your master. And all his relatives I've given to him as servants. And with grain and new wine, I've sustained him. Now as for you, then what can I do, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, my father. So Esau lifted his voice and wept. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, Away from the fertility of the earth will be your dwelling. And away from the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live. And your brother you will serve. But it will come about that when you become restless, you will break his yoke from your neck. And we'll stop there. Just for the sake of the kids, when, when the Bible says there that Esau will break Jacob's yoke off of his neck. Anybody know what a yoke is? When a farmer has a pair of cattle or a pair of oxen, okay, let's say, or a pair of like workhorses, and he wants to use them to plow a row so that he can plant grain or so that he can plant his produce. He hooks them up to a yoke, and then he might be able to work them. He might hook up a a plow behind them, right? So that they can plow. But the yoke is what binds the two animals together. 
so that they can work for the farmer. Okay? It's like a big harness for an animal because that animal is now a work animal. It's going to work for the farmer or for the owner. And so what the Bible is saying there that Esau is going to have a yoke on his neck placed on him by his brother Jacob, which means he's going to be in service to Jacob. Okay? The yoke, that's called the yoke or a harness on an animal's neck. I want to comment. I bring this up quite a bit, but this is one of the resources I use when I read through the Torah. There are ancient Aramaic translations called the Targums. And they act as commentary on these passages. Okay? And these the the Targum, the Aramaic translations of the scriptures really represents ancient oral tradition around the time of Yeshua, maybe even before. Okay? But on this verse 40 where it says, By your sword you shall live, and your brother you will serve. But it will come about when you become restless, you'll break his, note, his yoke from your neck. This is a, an English rendition of the Aramaic translation of that verse, the Targum. Listen to this. By your weapons you shall live, and before your brother you'll be subjected to him. But it will be when the sons of Jacob labor in the Torah and keep the commandments that they will set a yoke of obedience on your neck. But when the sons of Jacob withdraw themselves and don't study the Torah and don't keep the commandments, behold, you will break their yoke of obedience from off of your neck. Wow! That's fascinating commentary. That, and this is an understanding from, you know, from close to the first century, if not prior. That this is how people in Yeshua's day saw this passage of this struggle between Jacob and Esau. Is that Isaac, it's as if Isaac is saying to Esau, as long as Jacob and his descendants maintain their promises to God and maintain their covenant with God and obey God, you will be subjected to Jacob. But when they forsake the covenant with God and disobey his commands, that's going to be your ability and your power to throw his yoke off of your neck. Wow. And this is important because this kind of sets the stage. Isaac's blessing, what a blessing, right, of Esau, sets the stage for a conflict that will last thousands and thousands of years. And this really, what we just, what we just heard, describes the history of, of Israel's relationship with the people of Esau over time, that there's this constant back and forth, this power struggle between the two. And you see it even in the Hanukkah story. We might get to that either this week or next week. But even in the Hanukkah story, the Edomites play a role. This is little well known. But uh, as Jacob rises rises in the sense of as he rises in his righteousness, right, in his dedication to the Lord, Esau falls. As Jacob falls in his dedication to the Lord and his obedience to the Lord, Esau rises. So, Esau receives this blessing if it can be called such. And he hates that blessing so much that he's going to kill his brother Jacob. His mother Rebecca catches wind of it and she says, we got to send Jacob away or else he's going to die. And so Isaac and Rebecca swoop in and save the day. They save Jacob. They tell him, Leave this place, leave Canaan, go back to our family in Padan Aram. Go take a wife for yourself. Stay there until your brother, he's a hothead, stay there until he cools down. Then come back. So Jacob is obedient to his parents and he leaves. He doesn't know it at the point, but he's going to be gone for about 20 years. Quite a long time. While he's there, he picks up a wife, and not just a wife, picks up 
multiple wives, okay? Has 12 children, really has 11 children by the time he comes back. Benjamin wasn't quite born yet. But there came a time while he was staying with Laban, right, his relative in Padanaram, that finally the Lord came to him and said, it's time, Jacob. I'm establishing my covenant through you, through your descendants. It's time for you to go back to the land. Okay? And Jacob begins the trek. It's an arduous trek. And he's pursued along the way by Laban, his relative, who doesn't want him to leave. Right? And that is a whole drama in and of itself. But finally, he gains the victory over Laban, Levon, and he continues on his journey toward the land. When he hears, he finally hears, some messengers bring him word, Esau's heard that you're coming. He wants to see you. He's bringing 400 men with him. <laughs> wow. Intense. Jacob knows he's about to meet his brother again. And he's scared. He begins to lift up prayers to God. God, you told me to leave. You're the one that I'm in covenant with. I'm asking you to deliver me from my brother. And he takes measures because he's preparing to meet his brother. He splits his whole family and his whole camp and his servants into two separate camps because he says, hey, you know what? If Esau comes and attacks the one, maybe the other will get away. Right? And in the midst of this, you've heard the story of Jacob wrestling with a man, right? Right before his encounter with Esau, he wrestles with a man who's some sort of heavenly being. Okay? And it's through that wrestling that Jacob wrestles with this angel that the angel blesses him, or the Lord through the angel blesses Jacob and says, your name's no longer going to be Yaakov, Jacob. Your name's going to be Israel. Israel, which is a way to say he who rules with God or prevails with God because you have wrestled with God and with men and you've overcome. You're able. And Jacob, after that wrestling match, he's now, in a sense, ready to meet his brother. For the first time in 20 years. His brother, who the last time that he saw him, was swearing that as soon as their father died, he was going to kill him. Okay? If, you'll if you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 33, and we're going to read just a snippet about this meeting between Jacob and Esau, between the two brothers. And in Jacob's story, this is really the climax in their personal lives. In Jacob and Esau's personal lives, this is the climax of their struggle. Genesis 33, starting in verse 1. Then Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and four hundred men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids and their children in the front, and Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. But he himself passed on ahead of them and bowed down to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And they wept. And as you continue to read, there is what, at least on the surface, is a beautiful family reunion. And there's this exchanging of gifts, and Esau says, oh, you don't need to give me these things, but Jacob says, no, take them from me. He says, it's a, it's a blessing. I've seen your face again. It's like seeing the face of God. It's, it's, it's just this... You know, this kindness between the two momentarily. And then Esau says, well, come back with me to Mount Seir. And Jacob says, ah, you know, we're going we're gonna to have to go slow. Yeah. You know, we've got a big camp. We can't travel as fast as you. You go on ahead of us, and we'll be there. 
And Esau says, well, let me post some of my, some of my soldiers with you while you journey to be with me in Seir. And Jacob says, oh, no, it's okay. No problem. Don't worry about that. And Esau says, fine. So he takes his people, goes back to Mount Seir. Jacob goes back to the land of Israel. He goes to a place called Sukkot. Okay? So again, there's this, there's this reunion, but it's not entirely comfortable, okay? is it? What's fascinating is, I th we've got time, so I'll take a moment. I didn't have this ready on a slide, but I will take a moment and show you so that you can see what I'm talking about. Forgive me, but I, I think it's worth it. I think you'll enjoy it. A good, it's a good picture. Here we go. And I'm going to blow this up so that you can see it, or at least see it better. Let's make it real nice and big. Okay. This is verse 4 in Hebrew, where it says, Esau ran to greet him, he embraced him, and falling on his neck, he kissed him, and they wept. If you're not able to see this very well from where you're sitting, just let me know after a Bible study today, and I'll let you come up and you can see it, okay? I'll explain it. I'll just leave this screen here. But here is a Hebrew word, vayishakehu, which means, and he kissed him. Vayishakehu. And, you know, if you look close at Hebrew, at least Hebrew that's printed, you'll see lots of dots and dashes. And these dots and dashes represent vowels, or they represent um, how to sing the text because the Torah is sung when it's read in a public setting. And there are marks that tell you how to sing. Okay? But there are other marks in the Hebrew text that are unexplainable. Or, of course, there are lots of explanations. Nothing's unexplainable. <laughs> but it's not quite as clear why these dots and dashes are there. And these particular dots that I'm going to show you are ancient. These at least go back to the time period several hundred years after Yeshua. They're ancient. That as long as the Torah has been written, it's been written with dots like these. At least from the early centuries after Yeshua. At least. Okay? But here above this word, Vaishake, when he kissed him, there's a series of six dots. These dots serve no purpose. They do not tell the reader how to read that word. They do not tell the reader how to sing that word. They're just there. And they've been there for centuries. The, the sages, the ancient commentators of Israel, they commented about these dots. And they said, you know, this could be a reminder, or this could be an indicator, not a reminder, but an indicator, that when Esau kissed his brother, maybe it wasn't quite as sincere as the plain reading of the text makes out. And from the history that follows after this meeting, we know it wasn't too sincere. Unfortunately, the descendants of Esau continued to hate the descendants of Jacob. Okay? And there have been some who have compared these dots above Vayishakehu, above he kissed him, they've compared these dots even to teeth marks. As if to say... Maybe he kissed him, but maybe that kiss was a little painful. You know what I'm saying. And well, I just mentioned a few minutes ago about the Targums. They really serve as ancient, ancient commentary on these scriptures. Here is what the Targum has to say about verse 4 when Esau kissed his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell upon his neck and kissed him and they wept. Esau wept on account of the pain in his teeth, which had been shaken. And Jacob wept because of the pain in his neck. <laughs> which, again, is just an idea. Okay, This is just a commentary on this passage, but it's a commentary that's getting across the idea that this kiss wasn't quite as sincere as what we would hope it would be. Okay, and the, the tradition actually goes on to say that it's as if Esau went to bite Jacob, 
But God spared Jacob's life in that moment and hardened his neck. So Esau felt the pain of it. Now again, this is not necessarily to be taken literally. okay? But it's important because this is context on how the ancient Jewish people, even in Yeshua's day, viewed these passages. Okay? That even this momentary embrace between Jacob and Esau just wasn't quite as sincere as what it could have been. Okay? Now, there are others who say, no, in this moment, Esau was sincere. There are others who make that argument. And of course, you can go either way, right? We're not, we're not told, and it's interesting to explore the possibilities. Okay? However, whether this moment was sincere or not, it was unfortunately a flash in the pan. Okay. Esau went his separate way. Jacob went his separate way. Jacob's descendants went down into Egypt and eventually became slaves in the land of Egypt. God, through His mercy, sent a deliverer. He sent Moses. Okay. And through Moses, God redeemed the descendants of Jacob out of the land of Egypt. And they began their journey in the wilderness back to the promised land, back to the land of Canaan. Unfortunately, if you're familiar with the story, especially in the book of Numbers, we find out that journey took a lot longer than it should have taken. It took 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Okay? Because the first generation that came up out of the land of Egypt, they weren't ready. They rejected the land. And so they were forced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. But finally, towards the end of that period, they began making their trek towards the land. There's a problem with that. They're going to have to go through Esau's territory to get there. Rut-row. So I think we'll end with this today. Let's find out. Let's find out how this encounter goes. And keep in mind now, this is over. Uh, this is something like 400 years after that kiss between Jacob and Esau. Okay? Now there are two nations, not two brothers anymore, but two nations, two peoples. If you'll flip with me to Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20. This is the first major encounter of the two families now after the descendants of Jacob have been brought out of the land of Egypt. Numbers chapter 20, and I'm going to read verses 14 through 21, and we will end at this passage today. So starting in verse 14. From Kadesh, it's a town or a village, an area called Kadesh, Moses then sent messengers to the king of Edom. Remember, Edom is Esau. Thus your brother Israel has said, You know all the hardship that has befallen us, that our fathers went down to Egypt, and we stayed in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians treated us and our fathers badly. But when we cried out to the Lord, He heard our voice and sent an angel and brought us out from Egypt. Now behold, we are at Kadesh, a town on the edge of your territory, your border. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or through vineyard. We will not even drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway, not turning to the right or the left, until we pass through your territory. Edom, however, said to him, You shall not pass through us, or I will come out with the sword against you. Again, the sons of Israel said to him, We will go up by the highway, and if I and my livestock drink any of your water, I will pay its price. Let me just pass through on my feet, nothing else. But he said, You shall not pass through. And Edom came out against him with a heavy force and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to allow Israel to pass through his territory, so Israel turned away from him. They had to go around. Okay? 
So here is the very next meeting in the Torah between the families of Jacob and the families of Esau, and it doesn't go well. It doesn't go well. Jacob seeks peace, but no peace is available. Okay. You know, it was even mentioned, it says, we will buy the food. We will drink the water. And there's an idea behind this that I read about saying, you know, it's as if Moses or Israel is saying, we, while we pass through, we won't even eat our own food and drink our own water. We will specifically purchase from you so that our passage benefits you. Wow. But Esau says, mm -mm. nope, don't set foot here. For I'm coming against you with the sword. And unfortunately, like so many years before, Esau with his 400 men, the descendants of Esau come out with swords ready to fight. And lastly, I'll mention verse 21, what we just read, where Israel had to go around. They couldn't go through. Again, I, I pull quite a bit from the Targums because it gives us a perspective, a bird's eye view into how people really in Yeshua's time understood these scriptures. Okay? Or close to the time of Yeshua, how they understood these scriptures. This is, this is a translation, Aramaic translation of verse 21. So Edom would not suffer, or they would not allow Israel to pass through his coast. And Israel turned away from him because it was commanded from before the word of the heavens that they should not set battle in array against Edom because the time had not yet come when the punishment of Edom would be given into their hands. Again, this is a fascinating insight, I think. That the, the translation, the Targums make a comment on this verse that says, okay, Israel went around at this time. It's because at this time, the Lord had not yet given Esau into the hands of Jacob. That there was coming a time in the future when Esau would be given into the hands of Jacob. But that was not to be just yet. Okay? It, it almost reminds me, if you're familiar with when God made promises to Abraham initially, He says, no, for certain that your descendants will be slaves. They'll be They'll work hard in a land that's not theirs, in a foreign land. But then they'll come back here in the fourth generation because the iniquity of the Amorites isn't yet full. There's an idea that we see sometimes in the Scriptures. God has a way that He deals with nations. And He has a way that He deals with His people Israel. And in reading through the Hanukkah story, you'll actually see this spelled out in detail. That for the nations, God is incredibly, incredibly patient with them. He will wait years and years and centuries and millennia while a nation becomes more and more and more wicked. And He'll be patient to see if maybe, maybe that nation will turn around. There's always hope until the door closes. And for the nations, there's coming a day for nations that don't repent. A day when the throne of God is set up finally and the kingdom of God is established on this earth and the nations will come and give account. And there will be no more patience in that day. God will have expended, expended His patience. And it's as if that idea is seen here at least from the ancient Jewish perspective on Numbers chapter 20, that it's as if it's being said, now's not your time, Jacob, to make war with them, but there is a time coming. There is a time coming. With Israel, God deals a little bit differently. God quite often is not quite as patient with Israel in the sense of, when Israel violates the covenant that they've made with their Creator, the discipline comes pretty quick. It starts coming. Prophets start getting sent, right? Enemy nations start coming in, they, right? And it's all because God 
deals with Israel in the sense that a father deals very closely with his son. He doesn't deal with his children, with the people of Israel, like an enemy. Just waiting for the right time until he will destroy them. No, he comes in and starts to discipline them early because he wants them to turn back. Right? Because he doesn't want their suffering to be as great as the other nations. So it is said, and it's been said, that God punishes Israel so much in this age because he disciplines them like children. So that when they come back like obedient children, the age to come will be just blessing. Will be just life. Just the joy of a father with his children. Whereas with the nations, it's not so. He doesn't deal so closely. He deals like a king who's waiting for his subjects to turn. But if they don't, one day the door will close. Right? So, we're going to have to stop there for today. I just want to wrap up to say, we saw this week how the conflict between Jacob and Esau expands from two brothers to now two people groups. Okay? And from next week forward, we're going to see how this struggle plays out. And we might even get to the point where we see how the struggle plays out in the future. Okay? But we're going to see historically from this that we just read in Numbers, how the struggle between Jacob and Esau has played out and how the Messiah, the son of David, becomes involved in it. Okay? And how it's he who eventually is the one who brings Esau to his knees. So, we will end there. We will thank our Father in Heaven for His goodness. We will thank our Father in Heaven for His eternal covenant promises to His people Israel. That no matter what, that He is faithful. Praise God. And because of his faithfulness through the Messiah Yeshua, because of his words to the prophets, he promised that also from the nations he would take a people who were called by his name. That we could come and be joined in among the kingdom of Israel and serve God shoulder to shoulder with his people Israel. This is a blessing and a, a, an opportunity for rejoicing. And this is a call... I know for us here, for most of us here, this is preaching to the choir. But this is something, a message that we can carry out to the nations of the world around us, to our family members. This day and age, we have the chance maybe to be like an Esau who would come and give a sincere kiss to his brother Jacob instead of a bite. That we can come and be a sincere brother and serve God shoulder to shoulder and say... Bo Yeshua, come Yeshua, come King of Israel. We thank you, Father God. We thank you for your goodness, Abba Father. Thank you so much for your faithfulness, Abba Father, to all of us. And we feel it in our daily life. And we want to shine like lights for you, Abba Father, in this Hanukkah season. And proclaim that the day will come when the Messiah will have the victory over all the enemies of His people, of His brothers. And praise God, with Your help, Father God, we will be there. We will be there cheering Him on. We will be there watching Yeshua win the victory. Thank You, Father God. In Yeshua's name, Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. And again, as always, let's continue with discussion. Anyone has any questions or anything after service? But let's gather the kids and let's bless them.